The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Chapter 7. A Day with the Beavers. While the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried, Oh! and stopped. The robin! cried Lucy. The robin! It's flown away! And so it had, right out of sight. And now what are we to do? said Edmund, giving Peter a look which was as much to say, What did I tell you? Shh! Look! said Susan. What? said Peter. There's something moving among the trees over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it that time too, said Peter. It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan. And then, though nobody said it out loud, everyone suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like? said Lucy. It's, it's some kind of animal, said Susan. And then, look, look, quick, there it is. They all saw it this time, a whiskered, furry face which had looked out at them from behind a tree. But this time it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth, just as humans put their finger on their lips when they are signaling to you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood, holding their breath. A moment later, the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all around as if it were afraid someone was watching, said, Hush! made signs to them to join it in the thicker bit of wood where it was standing, and then once more disappeared. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver. I saw the tail. It wants us to go to it, said Susan, and it is warning us not to make a noise. I know, said Peter. The question is, are we going to it or not? What do you think, Lou? I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shan't we have to risk it? said Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here, and I feel I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter. Let's give it a try. All keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it, and there, sure enough, they found the beaver. But it still drew back, saying to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, Further in, come further in, right in here, we're not safe in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and the brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had been able to fall there, did it begin to talk to them. Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? It said. We're some of them said Peter. Shh, shh, said the beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe even here. Why, who are you afraid of? said Peter. There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. Most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us to her. You know who I mean. And it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know you're a friend? Not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, added Peter, but you see, we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With these words it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise. Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave to poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fellow. He got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to him, I must meet you here and take you on to... Here, the beaver's voice sank into silence and it gave one or two very mysterious nods. Then, signaling to the children to stand as close around it as they possibly could, so that their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers, it added in a low whisper, They say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now, a very curious thing happened. None of the children knew who Aslan was any more than you do. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps it has sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something which you don't understand, but
but in the dream it feels as if it had some enormous meaning, either a terrifying one which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get into that dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each one of the children felt something jump in its inside. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize that it is the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. And what about Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy. Where is he? Shh, 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 said the beaver. Not here. I must bring you where we can have a real talk and also dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty about trusting the beaver now, and everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend, who led them at a surprisingly quick pace, and always in the thickest parts of the forest, for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later they came out under the open sky, the sun was still shining, and found themselves looking down on a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley at the bottom of which ran, at least it would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across this river, and when they saw it, everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams, and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that he now had a sort of modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when you are visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, What a lovely dam! And Mr. Beaver didn't say, Hush! this time, but merely a trifle, merely a trifle, and it isn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but was now, of course, a level floor of dark green ice. And below the dam, much lower down, was more ice, but instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into the foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there was now a glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all over with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle, and partly on top of the dam, was a funny little house shaped rather like an enormous beehive. And from a hole in the roof, smoke was going up, so that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was what the others chiefly noticed, but Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which came down another small valley to join it. And looking up that valley, Edmund could see two small hills, and he was almost sure they were the two hills which the white witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamp post that other day. And then between them, he thought, must be her palace, only a mile off or less. And he thought about Turkish delight and about being a king, and I wonder how Peter will like that, he asked himself, and horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, said Mr. Beaver, and it looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way, but be careful and don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not, for humans, a very nice place to walk, because it was covered with ice, and though the frozen pool was level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them in a single file right out to the middle, where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I've found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a burring sound, and the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old she-beaver sitting in the corner with a thread in her mouth working busily at her sewing machine, and it was from it that the sound came. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both her wrinkled old paws. At last, to think that I should live to see this day. The potatoes are on boiling and the kettle's singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house. Peter went with him, and across the ice of the deep pool, to where he had a little hole in the ice which he kept open every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly at the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being so chilly looked hard into it, then suddenly shot in his paw, and before you could say Jack Robinson, had whisked out a beautiful trout. 
Then he did it all over again until they had a fine catch of fish. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver to fill the kettle and lay the table and cut the bread and put the plates in the oven to heat and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in the corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and get the dripping hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a very snug little home, though it was not at all like Mr. Tumnus's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds there were bunks, like on board ship, built into the wall, and there were hams and strings of onions hanging from the roof, and against the walls were gum boots and oilskins and hatchets and pairs of shears and spades and trowels and things for carrying mortar in and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks, and the cloth on the table, though very clean, was very rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish, which Mr. Beaver had already opened with his knife and cleaned out in the open air. You can think how good the new caught fish smelled while they were frying, and how the hungry children longed for them to be done, and how very much hungrier still they had become before Mr. Beaver said, Now we're nearly ready. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range while Lucy was helping Mr. Beaver to dish up the trout so that in a very few minutes, everyone was drawing up their stools. It was all three-legged stools in the beaver's house, except for Mrs. Beaver's own special rocking chair beside the fire, and preparing to enjoy themselves. There was a jug of creamy milk for the children, Mr. Beaver stuck to beer, and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table, from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat a good freshwater fish if you eat it when it has been alive half an hour ago and has come out of a pan half a minute ago. And when they had finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and gloriously sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot, and at the same time moved the kettle onto the fire so that when they had finished the marmalade roll, the tea was made and ready to be poured out. And when each person got his or her cup of tea, each person shoved back his or her stool so as to be able to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment. And now, said Mr. Beaver, pushing away his empty beer mug and pulling his cup of tea toward him, if you'll just wait till I've got my pipe lit up and going nicely, why, now we can get to business. It's snowing again, he added, cocking his eye at the window. That's all the better, because it means we shan't have any visitors. And if anyone should have been trying to follow you, why, he won't find any tracks. The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe Chapter 8 What Happened After Dinner And now, said Lucy, do please tell us what's happened to Mr. Tumnus. Ah, that's bad, said Mr. Beaver, shaking his head. That's a very, very bad business. There's no doubt he was taken off by the police. I got that from a bird who saw it done. But where's he been taken to? asked Lucy. Well, they were headed northward when they were last seen, and we all know what that means. No, we don't, said Susan. Mr. Beaver shook his head in a very gloomy fashion. I'm afraid it means they were taking him to her house, he said. But what'll they do to him, Mr. Beaver? gasped Lucy. Well said Mr. Beaver. You can't exactly say for sure, but there's not many take it in there that ever comes out again. Statues. All full of statues, they say it is. In the courtyard and up the stairs and in the hall, people she's turned. He paused and shuddered. Turned into stone. But, Mr. Beaver, said Lucy, can't we, I mean, we must do something to save him. It's too dreadful, and it's all on my account. I don't doubt you'd save him if you could, dearie, said Mrs. Beaver, but you've no chance of getting into that house against her will and ever coming out alive. Couldn't we have some stratagem, said Peter. I mean, couldn't we dress up as something or pretend to be, oh, peddlers or anything, or watch until she's gone out, or, oh, hang it all, there must be some way. This fawn saved my sister at his own risk, Mr. Beaver. We can't just leave him to be... To be, to have that done to him. It's no good, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver. No good you're trying, of all people. But now that Aslan is on the move. Oh, yes, tell us about Aslan, said several voices at once. 
For once again, that strange feeling, like the first signs of spring, like good news, had come over them. Who is Aslan? asked Susan. Aslan, said Mr. Beaver, why, you don't know, he's the king. He's the lord of the whole wood, but not often here, you understand, never in my time or my father's time, but the word has reached us that he has come back. He is in Narnia at this moment. He'll settle the White Queen all right. It is he, not you, that will save Mr. Tumnus. She won't turn him into stone too, said Edmund. Lord love you, son of Adam, what a simple thing to say, answered Mr. Beaver with a great laugh. <laughs> turn him into stone. If she can stand on her two feet and look him in the face, it'll be the most she can do, and more than I expect of her. No, no, he'll put all to rights, as it says in an old rhyme in these parts. Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. At the sound of his roar, sorrows will be no more. When he bears his teeth, winter meets its death. And when he shakes his mane, we shall have spring again. You'll understand when you see him. But shall we see him? asked Susan. Why, daughter of Eve, that's what I brought you here for. I'm to lead you where you shall meet him, said Mr. Beaver. Is, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan, a man, said Mr. Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I'd thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I'm longing to see him said Peter, even if I do feel frightened when it comes to the point. That's right, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver, bringing his paw down on the table with a crash that made all the cups and saucers rattle. And so you shall. Word has been sent that you are to meet him tomorrow, if you can, at the stone table. Where's that? said Lucy. I'll show you, said Mr. Beaver. It's down the river, a good step from here. I'll take you to it. But meanwhile, what about poor Mr. Tumnus? said Lucy. The quickest way you can help him is by going to meet Aslan, said Mr. Beaver. Once he's with us, then we can begin doing things. Not that we don't need you, too, for that's another of the old rhymes. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Carapervel in throne, the evil time will be over and done. So things must be drawing near their end now he's come and you've come. We have heard of Aslan coming into these parts before. Long ago, nobody can say when, but there's never been any of your race here before. That's what I don't understand, Mr. Beaver, said Peter. I mean, isn't the witch herself human? She'd like us to believe it, said Mr. Beaver. And it's on that that she bases her claim to be queen, but she's no daughter of Eve. She comes of your father Adam's, here Mr. Beaver bowed, your father Adam's first wife. Her they called Lilith, and she was one of the jinn. That's what she comes from on one side, and on the other side she comes of the giants. No, no, there isn't a drop of real human blood in the witch. That's why she's bad all through, Mr. Beaver, said Mrs. Beaver. True enough, Mrs. Beaver, replied he. There may be two views about humans, meaning no offense to the present company, but there's no two views about things that look like humans and aren't. I've known good dwarfs, said Mrs. Beaver. So have I. Now you come to speak of it, said her husband, but precious few, and they were the ones least like men. But in general, take my advice, when you meet anything that's going to be human and isn't yet, or used to be human once and isn't now, or ought to be human and isn't, you keep your eyes on it and feel for your hatchet. And that's why the witch is always on the lookout for any humans in Narnia. She's been watching for you this many a year, and if she knew there were four of you, she'd be more dangerous still. 
What's that to do with it? asked Peter. Because of another prophecy, said Mr. Beaver, down at Caraparavel, that's the castle on the sea coast down at the mouth of this river, which ought to be the capital of the whole country if it was all as it should be, down at Caraparavel there are four thrones, and it's a saying in Narnia, time out of mind, that when two sons of Adam and two daughters of Eve sit in those four thrones, then it will be the end not only of the white witch's reign, but of her life. And that is why we had to be so cautious as we came along. For if she knew about you four, your lives wouldn't be worth a shake of my whiskers. All the children had been attending so hard to what Mr. Beaver was telling them that they had noticed nothing else for a long time. Then, during the moment of silence that followed his last remark, Lucy suddenly said, I say, where's Edmund? There was a dreadful pause, and then everyone began asking, who saw him last? How long has he been missing? Is he outside? And then all rushed to the door and looked out. The snow was falling thickly and steadily. The green ice of the pool had vanished under a thick white blanket, and from where the little house stood in the center of the dam, you could hardly see either bank. Out they went, plunging well over their ankles into the soft new snow, and went round the house in every direction. Edmund! Edmund! they called till they were hoarse, but the silently falling snow seemed to muffle their voices, and there was not even an echo in answer. How perfectly dreadful, said Susan, as they at last came back in despair. Oh, how I'd wish we'd never come. What on earth are we to do, Mr. Beaver? said Peter. Do, said Mr. Beaver, who was already putting on his snow boots. Do, we must be off at once. We haven't a moment to spare. We'd better divide into four search parties, said Peter, and all go in different directions. Whoever finds him must come back here at once and... Search parties, son of Adam, said Mr. Beaver. What for? Why, to look for Edmund, of course. There's no point in looking for him, said Mr. Beaver. What do you mean, said Susan? He can't be far away yet, and we've got to find him. What do you mean when you say there's no use looking for him? The reason there's no use looking, said Mr. Beaver, is that we know already where he's gone. Everyone stared in amazement. Don't you understand, said Mr. Beaver. He's gone to her, to the White Witch. He has betrayed us all. Oh, surely. Oh, really, said Susan. He can't have done that. Can't he, said Mr. Beaver, looking very hard at the three children, and everything they wanted to say died on their lips, for each felt suddenly quite certain inside that this was exactly what Edmund had done. But will he know the way, said Peter. Has he been in this country before? asked Mr. Beaver. Has he ever been here alone? Yes, said Lucy, almost in a whisper. I'm afraid he has. And did he tell you what he'd done or who he'd met? Well, no, he didn't said Lucy. Then mark my words, said Mr. Beaver. He has already met the White Witch and joined her side and been told where she lives. I didn't like to mention it before, he being your brother and all, but the moment I set eyes on that brother of yours, I said to myself, treacherous. He had the look of one who has been with the witch and eaten her food. You can always tell them, if you've lived long enough in Narnia, something about their eyes. All the same, said Peter, in a rather choking sort of voice. We'll still have to go and look for him. He is our brother, after all, even if he is rather a little beast, and he's only a kid. Go to the witch's house, said Mrs. Beaver. Don't you see that the only chance of saving either him or yourselves is to keep away from her? What do you mean? said Lucy. Why, all she wants is to get all four of you, She's thinking all the time of those four thrones at Care Paravel. Once you are four inside of her house, her job would be done, and there'd be four new statues in her collection before you'd have time to speak. But she'll keep him alive as long as he's the only one she's got, because she'll want to use him as a decoy, as bait to catch the rest of you with. Oh, can no one help us? wailed Lucy. Only Aslan said Mr. Beaver. We must go on and meet him. That's our only chance now. 
It seems to me, my dears, said Mrs. Bieber, that it is very important to know just when he slipped away. How much he can tell her depends on how much he heard. For instance, had we started talking of Aslan before he left? If not, then we may do very well, for she won't know that Aslan has come to Narnia, or that we are meeting him, and will be quite off her guard as far as that is concerned. I don't remember him being here when we were talking about Aslan, began Peter, but Lucy interrupted him. Oh, yes, he was, she said miserably. Don't you remember? It was he who asked whether the witch couldn't turn Aslan into stone, too. So he did, by Jove, said Peter, just the sort of thing he would say, too. Worse and worse, said Mr. Beaver. And the next thing is this. Was he still here when I told you that the place for meeting Aslan was the stone table? And, of course, no one knew the answer to this question. Because if he was, continued Mr. Beaver, then she'll simply sledge down in that direction and get between us and the stone table and catch us on our way down. In fact, we shall be cut off from Aslan. But that isn't what she'll do first, said Mrs. Beaver. Not if I know her. The moment that Edmund tells her that we're all here, she'll set out to catch us this very night. And if he's been gone about half an hour, she'll be here in about another twenty minutes. You're right, Mrs. Beaver, said her husband. We must all get away from here. There's not a moment to lose. 